Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves going again with the second part of session 16. Uh, for the second part, what we really want to start doing today is looking at these different control schemes. And we're going to look at two in particular. We're going to look at something called a while loop. And we're going to start thinking about the genetic schemes for controlling the way we march through things. The big idea behind what we're doing in this next little section is really trying to think about just how we go searching for solutions. And at a high level, list maps are exhaustive, but somewhat inefficient in that if you sort of know there's a total range of values you want to kind of search exhaustively over, list maps are very good. You sort of set up the beginning of the range, you set up the end of the range. Super if there's only one variable, as it starts to be two variables, you have to multiply those things together because you have all the data points. If there's three variables or four, it starts to get to be a whole lot of points that need to be considered. Mm -hmm. So exhaustive strategies sometimes aren't always the best. The good news about exhaustive strategies is they will go through and find. You know, they will find some relatively good points no matter where they are scattered through those spaces. Okay? But you know, they're not necessarily the most efficient. So if you need to do something kind of quickly to sort of come up with kind of a range of values that are pretty close to what you want, there might be other strategies you want to use instead first and then go exhaustive. In fact, that's perfectly valid to think about hybrid strategies which sort of use kind of very high level schemes to test values in widely different areas and then zero in and do a very exhaustive search when you think you're near the optimum. Okay. Well looping uses a different scheme. Well looping looks in some way on the list map, but as opposed to going all the way from, for example, zero to one hundred on some input value, it's gonna start at some point, it's gonna increment, kind of like the list map does, but every step of the way you're gonna check to see is something true. And if it's true, it'll continue to loop. As soon as that thing becomes false, you'll stop looping. Okay, and this is useful sometimes if you're not exactly sure where the optimum is going to be, or you know that just as a general rule, you can completely wipe out certain parts of the search space. Because, for example, if we're optimizing a building, if we are trying to change different parameters and we cross the threshold on the number of square feet of floor area, we might sort of get to the zone where all, that just can't be considered any longer because things that are bigger than that just aren't going to be allowed. So well looping tends to allow us to sort of just trim the search area by saying as soon as you sort of exceed some boundary, why bother computing everything beyond the boundary? It's like as soon as you hit that boundary, just don't look any further down that, that branch. Okay, so it's just all about trying to be a little more efficient. Mm -hmm. To do this, it actually works very, very similar to list mapping in that you're going to set up a custom node. Okay, what we're going to do is go through and set up a range of values, a starting value, an increment value, and loop through. And if every step along the way, we're going to check to see if something's true. And then finally, what we're going to do is go back and set the element to have the target value. So that's kind of the overall scheme of where we're going. Maybe even providing a little color feedback along the way in terms of understanding how close you are to the value. Now, setting up the custom node, that's kind of A-OK -okay in terms of it's going to be very similar to things we've done before where we set some test parameter and get some result. That's going to be very common to a lot of what we do. We're going to go through and put in some sort of target value that we're going to want to achieve. So we're going to put in, oh, just you know, some sort of parameter and really you know, what is the value where if it crosses that value, we no longer want to uh, keep on going. That will be considered our target. In terms of the true condition, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. The way the while condition is Work, it works with in Dynamo, works a little bit different than the way you might expect. It continues to iterate while the condition is true. Okay. The problem is it also will go one step farther than the last time or the last condition that actually meets the true because it almost has to go move ahead one step further to figure out it broke. And then you have to back off one. So as we're going through and thinking about it, we're just going to do a little messing around with it to sort of always be kind of playing with a game of, you know, where we say we are, but always looking one step ahead. 
and then being able to back up one step. Because it doesn't really figure out it broke until it breaks, but you don't want it to break. You want to go back to the last good value. That's the best way to explain it. So that's really the overall algorithm we're going to use. And let's just kind of go over to, oh, like a 16.2, say 1A. We'll go from there and just kind of look at the node. And basically, in terms of what we're going to do, is we're just going to put in a whole lot of different sort of inputs to this node. We're going to put in the element we want to test. We're going to put in the parameter we're going to test. We're going to say the test value, the test increment, the result that we want. Actually, we can leave out the unit. That part we got rid of because uh, Dynamo uh, sort of fixed that for us. And the path where we want to do the results. But let's go ahead and take a look at it. I skipped one little thing, important thing there. It's the loop initial value. This has to do with, uh, well, it's the whole issue of being whether you're looking at the current instance or you're looking ahead one. But you'll see, it's easier to sort of explain when you actually see it. So if you can, please come with me to, uh, let's go to, actually open 1B. Oh, for the example, go looping until target value is met. Again, we'll start with sort of a very simple form because we can sort of understand that simple form and then move on beyond that. So this little simple form is just a nice little box. Sort of see the box is, what, it's 10 by 10 right now. The height is 22 right now. We have a gross volume. Again, I like to use this just because it's really easy to understand what's going on. If we're comparing against gross volume, you'll sort of have a pretty good sense of when we're going to cross that threshold based on varying the height. Okay, so we got that part. That's not looking too bad. Let me just kind of pan that over a little. Now we'll come back over to Dynamo and look at just building this. So in the world of Dynamo, let me open up. Six, what's that? The screen. Ah, okay, you get that? Okay, here's the big node we're going to use. And inside that big node, um, it basically looks very similar to the things we've been doing with list mapping. If you go through and open that custom node, we'll edit that custom node, you'll see you have seen things like this before. Let me kind of get out of that area where all the pink is. That pink's a little problematic right now, but let's save that discussion for a little bit. We have some different input parameters. We're going to basically bring in elements. Then we're going to set a test parameter. We're going to set that parameter to a value. Okay, so if you think about this, for example, being a building form element, the test parameter is going to be height. We'll pass in the name height. We're going to set it to some value. We'll set it from 2, 4, 6, 8, and be iterating through different heights. Okay? And We'll transaction end that all the time, because every time we update it, we need the Revit element to update so that we can get the result. Then the result parameter, that's going to be volume, gross volume, something like that. We're going to pull that out, okay, and basically uh, get that as a result parameter. That's a high level what we're up to. It's basically, we're going to set it to different heights. We're going to go through and pull out different uh, volumes. Okay, and that's how it works out. There's a funny little thing in here in terms of test value and test increment. There's this thing about always wanting to look one step ahead from the value we're currently testing. So I'm always going to add test value plus the increment and plug that in. I'm always looking one step ahead of myself. So when I'm testing 10, I'm actually going to test 12. Because I need to sort of look one step ahead and sort of figure out did I break or not. Okay. I know that's really weird and confusing, but You'll see it actually sort of works. It took a long time to start to figure out a way to try and do this. Okay, once you go through and you grab those values, there's a little bit of a back end here. 
We're going to go through and put those results in a data row. That is, we're going to take the input value, we're going to take the result value, and just put them into a data row so we can return that. And then ultimately, we're going to write that out to a data file. So we're going to write it out to a CSV file. Now, in the big pink zone here, there's a lot of stuff going on right in there. This is all about writing out the data file. The only part that's active right now is the middle part because all my little if infrastructure is a little bit messed up right now. You might remember I've been having trouble with ifs this quarter because the if changed itself around. But basically what I'm going to do is take a file and add the row to the tail end of it and write that file back out. Everything else in here has to do with either writing a header on the first loop or taking out the value on the last loop. But the only part that's really active right now is this node here following it through and then ultimately writing out the data value. So for what we're doing today, that's going to be simple enough. This is an example of there's some bug in the code in terms of doing what I really want to do in terms of writing the data file. But the good news is, is that since this is all sitting here in a custom node, I can go through and keep on changing around this custom node and whenever I get it that figured out, it'll apply to everything that's using that custom node. So, you know, for right now, just we're just going to write out every data uh, value as a data row to the CSV file. Okay. All this ifing in there is really just to write out a prettier file. But uh, it's not working right now, so I'm not going to worry about it at this point. Come back over here. So we have, back over here, some input values, an element we want to change, a height is the uh, test parameter. We have the initial value for the height, which is going to be 10. The increment is going to be 12. Okay. We're going to pass those in. What happens is, oh, for the test value, the loop initial value, I always go through and pass in, it's going to sound weird, I basically take the initial test value, which is uh, 10, and I subtract off the test value increment. What I'm doing is I'm taking 10, I'm taking an 8, because I'm about to make it 10 again inside the loop. Okay. That sounds really weird and confusing. But for a while loop, it's just kind of this funny thing we have to do to kind of pull it into sort of understanding which iteration we're working on. Okay, gross volume, results parameter, results file path. Let's go ahead and change that for you. We need to go ahead and put your results somewhere. So go ahead and browse out to some path on your desktop or someplace that's convenient for you. I'm going to call this session 16 looping. And you want to make it a file of type txt. So just go ahead and give it a some nice name like session 16 looping.txt. We'll send it up. Now, at a high level, we can go through and just run this as a list map. You know how to do that as a list map. If you wanted to, for example, just change, check a whole bunch of different values. For example, if I wanted to check a range of input values on the heights that was going anywhere from 10 to 30, or something like that, I could do that. And what I would do is just say list map. I'm going to give it a list of values that go everywhere from 10 dot dot to, I'll say, 30 dot dot, incrementing by, say, 5. I'll pull that in as a list. For the function, I'll pull this in. And because the whole is on test value, it's going to put in 10, it's going to put in 15, 20, 25. So that's the way we have been doing it so far. And I'll run that just to show you a sense of what that looks like, but then we're going to go through and do it as a loop as opposed to just doing it as a list map. Same functional work, though. So we're hanging out over here. Let me go ahead and run this. You can sort of see it went on through and did what it did. 
Okay, the last value came on out. Let's just go ahead and take a look at the text file that came on out the backside. Well, actually, even in here with a list map, I should be able to sort of see some sort of range of values out of there. There is the range of values that are going everywhere from 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. But what we were trying to do with all this uh, kind of pink infrastructure was go through and actually write a text file to that would actually store our results. And if I go to section 16 looping and you open that up, empty right now, which is kind of annoying. It's my whole, let me going to put in, I'm just going to put A, B, or let me put in there height, volume, and save that away. Again, my, my pink infrastructure for writing out the files messed up right now, but this should work. So let me try writing that again for you. Okay, hopefully that's good back over there. Let's just take a look at it in the text file. Okay. Not too awfully bad in terms of what's going on. As a list map, it's still doing the messing around with it's adding the test in there, because I didn't really adjust for that. Notice also it's got this really funny thing. I think Dom, you asked about this last time. Like, it gives you, yeah, it wants to be 1,200. And it's giving you that really ugly looking number right there. And that's just a little bit of rounding error in terms of what's going on. We could round those numbers. So I go ahead and kind of bring that down and make that look a little bit more reasonable. But this is kind of the idea of what we have in mind. Okay. The deal is, though, if we knew that, for example, as soon as this thing got to be 2,000 cubic feet, or uh, that's funny. All right. The volume, <laughs> cubic feet sounds so small. It, well, yeah, it's only 10 by 10, never mind. If it uh, got over the 2,000, we knew we wanted it to stop. Okay. We wouldn't really care about 22, 27, and 32. We would like to stop it and just have it stop at the last valid value. And that's what looping's all about. Yeah? I was about to provide the height and the, just typing out height and volume matter. Is it reading in? Say again? So when you type height and volume, it populates the text. Oh, no, no, no. That was just, it, it's, it's a problem with just my text file. It was trying to read a blank text file and it wasn't reading anything. By putting that little bit of information at the top, it gave it something to start with. So that has nothing to do with the computation. That's really just my mistake in the pink zone. Oh, no, I was looking at what was going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's all that's going on there. So try writing that, or if you haven't run that yet, just hold that thought. But if you can, go through and give yourself a little notepad file that has like height and volume just in the first line and save that away. So we're going to need that in just a second. So again, the problem with this strategy is since it's exhaustive, it doesn't stop at any particular target. If we knew that our target was 2,000, again, 22, 27, and 32 just shouldn't even have been considered. Okay, so we want to find a way to eliminate that from happening, or stop that from happening. Okay, so I'm going to go back over to Revit. The structure we're going to use is actually called a while loop, or loop while. But let's go ahead and open it up and see what it looks like. Um, let me go ahead and open up, if you can, 2A. And we'll put this back together. Over here on the side, this is just the same as it used to be. We're selecting the element, the height. Here I'm starting at a value of zero. That's probably not the best value to start out with. Maybe I'm going to start it out a little bit higher. I'll start it at a value of five. Or 10. I don't know. We'll say eight. Going to increment it by two. So I should be checking eight, 10, or 10 12, 14, 16. Gross volume is which I'm pulling out. I'll say that let's go ahead and target the value of 2,000 as my target value. Let's go ahead and also adjust my little text file down here so it points to the right file. So let's say session 16. Where did it go? It's on my desktop. OK, 
Okay, here's what a well looks like. Well is actually kind of like a list map, but it has three parts that you're going to connect together. Okay, you are still going to go through and use that very same function that we used before that still has one hole in it. Okay, but here's what you got to do. You basically always tell it really what is an initial value, that is the first value to test. You basically give it um, something to do on every loop, continue well, that is for every loop where this condition is still true, do this thing, okay? Then you actually go through and uh, you increment. Okay, and you increment, in our case, what we're gonna be doing is every time we go through and loop, we're gonna take the test value and increment it by a value which is the increment value. So how this works, if you want to hook it all together, is you take the loop initial value that goes to init. Okay. In terms of what to do for incrementing it, what we're always going to do is take whatever value was the first value that came in, we're going to add to it the test increment. And then in terms of what to do for the body, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take whatever value is currently in there, we're going to plug it in as test value, we're going to get a result. And then we're going to take that result and compare it to whether it's less or greater than or less than or equal to the test value, which is two thousand. Okay, and based upon whether that's true or not, it'll decide whether to go through another loop. So how that works is I got the init, I have the loop body, that one I don't have to do any changing on. In terms of what to do for every loop, I want it to not only go through and evaluate the individual node, but I also want to do the comparison. So, so I have to bring those together in this function compose. What that does is that's almost like making a little custom node. It's basically running that one and taking the result of that and passing it down to this one. Okay, so that's the basic structure of a while loop. It always initial value. It has what to do in terms of incrementing. Generally, every time through the loop, you want to increment that initial value. And then we're going through and uh, just doing a little bit of a comparison. We're computing the value so we can check whether or not it is less than or equal to that. So let's pause and see how you guys are doing in terms of just hanging that together. Okay, so. Actually, no, because what it does is this kind of really interesting thing. Okay, see at the top, you like init, that's sort of known as the initial value. It's going to pass that in into the x for the plus then. And for the x with the greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, what it's going to do is take the result value for every loop and pass it down as the less than or equal to. So what's happening here is the result here is passed to there. And that's the way function compose works, is it always takes the output of one node and passes it to the input to the next node. Mm. Tricky. Kind of Weirdly strange. Okay, you're looking good, you're looking good, you're looking good, excellent. Ms. Lama is looking fantastic. Okay, so that's the basic structure. Let's go ahead, Ms. Randy, you doing good? Excellent. Okay, let's try running this and see what it looks like. So again, I'll kind of expose that just so I can sort of see it in the background. Let me do a little run. See what's happening. Okay, so I said I wanted to actually get to 2,000 cubic feet. If you look back here in the background, you actually see, hey, I'm not quite at 2,000 feet. I'm actually at 2,200 cubic feet. Okay, and let's talk about why that is. You'll see that the height we got to is actually 22. We needed to go through and get to 22 
figure out that we were no longer valid. Okay, because at 20 we were valid, but we couldn't actually sort of figure out whether we were going to cross the threshold. So we had to go ahead a level, but let's show you what this funny node does. What it returns at the tail end of the whole process is it gives you the test value that last worked. Okay, so even though we are at 22 over here in the graph, it actually knows the last thing that I actually got to work was 20. Okay. It's weird. I know the logic is kind of inverted. that You always have to step ahead and just figure out when it breaks. And then this thing spits out the last value that works. But the good news is as soon as we have something like that, which is going to spit out the last value that works, we can use this very same function to go through and set it to that value and that will actually have the value that you need. Okay, so let's pause here for a second. Did you get the part where you have the 20 over here? Nope. Nope. Okay, let's go. What do you have over there? 20. Now, did you hit uh, change? Is giving your construct of the inputs. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah. To you? Okay. It should be the last value that works. So, the idea is as follows. If you can put together this loop, which always has kind of the initial value, kind of how to increment the value every time, and then test it, and then compare it, test and compare it, okay, you can always figure out really what the last value is that works. So if you want to then go through and actually use that value, we just need to go one step further. Step through, we just set up the loop. Again, the loop always has the initial value. It has the continue while condition. Okay, then it has the loop body. We're always going to go through and just check whether the last value or the output of this thing is the uh, last value where it was actually true. Step three is let's go ahead and set the element to the last good value. We have something else which is very useful to us. We're going to take that custom node, and we're basically going to plug the value in using function apply, meaning at the last test value. Actually, I'm going to try it without that first and see if it works, because I don't think we may need that. But let's see. OK. If you can please, actually, I think you can even do it here. Let's just try it first. At the tail end of all this, you would like to go through and just uh, set it, okay? So let's go ahead and do this. Let's go through and, as opposed to doing it with a list map and all that, take that same node, that very same node you have over here, and just feed that in as the value. Let me try running this and see how it does. So we're going to run. Nope, still doing that. Hang on, I think I need a little bit of logic to this whole thing because since test value is basically, oh, I, what I need to do is actually subtract it back out again. Yeah, minus the test value increment. take that value and I'll take the test increment. It's got that little hitch at the end. What it's always going to do is go to the very end and then back off one. 
there for a second because that's kind of the gist of it in terms of how you have to work with this. You can try this in a lot of different ways. For example, oh, you know, if you want 2,000, like it's sort of interesting about the last one that works because even here, it sort of is very sensitive to how you go through and feed values into it. Hi, Claire. For example, let's just try some different strategies here. Example, we are going to the value of 2,000. We are doing this by basically incrementing by 2. Let's try some different things. What if we were incrementing by 3 as opposed to 2? So if we were incrementing by 3 and ran that, what would that, would that 8, 11, oh, that actually comes up to an even number 2. Let me go ahead and start it at 7 and go by 3. That'll give me 7, 10, 13, 16. Notice that the best you could do in this case, since I started at 7 and I went by 3, is to get it up to 19. Because if I was incrementing by 3, that was the last valid value. So you always have to watch out for this in terms of just, uh, just how you increment it. If you go through and increment it by 1, you're certain to catch it. Yeah, you like, that little hitch at the end is pretty good. But this is almost the tail end of what you like to do um, with some of the examples like Claire with the, the pie example. After you found the value and you iterated through, you'd like to go back and say, here's the best value. Now let's go through and set the value to the optimum. It's kind of just like that. So the idea with this is really that you can go through and run this kind of iteration and kind of go working through and really find anything. So, whether it is 2,000, if it turns out that what you're really interested in is 2,400 or 2,500, it'll go through and grow. So the interesting thing about this as a control strategy, though, just at a high level for you, is yeah, you don't necessarily know what the end point's going to be. It might have been 100, it might have been 2,000. You don't really know. You just know keep on going until you hit the target volume, and then it only goes as far as it needs to. It goes one step too far, and then we back it off, and you actually get uh, the true value. So it's pretty good as a control scheme for going through to try and build something like this. So. Let me just do a little looking at that text file to see what's been happening back over there. Again, I think it's probably a little messed up, but let me just sort of see what's happening out there. Here you see our little bit of a running history in terms of, oh, the last round was starting at seven and going up to 25. Before that, we went from like seven to 20. But Basically, what we're doing is that every step of the way, we're going through and just recording those values. And that could be useful. You've got to decide really for yourself whether you are interested in seeing the intermediate points along the path or whether you're only interested in seeing the final result. Okay, because your final result, that final graph, is what you consider to be you know, the one that meets the target. It's whether you care about seeing all these things in there. And all that pink zone stuff was really just about writing out these intermediate values. Okay, but I'll work on fixing that node so it does a little bit better job. It's just kind of ugly right now because <laughs> it's putting all the ones in there and well, actually it's sort of interesting here. That's not too bad. You can sort of see the 26, 25. You can see where it, it overshot and backed up. Okay, yeah. Which is not clean as a data file looks, but actually it is, ac it is accurate. With all that pink zone stuff was doing, it was basically trying to strip off the last one in the case where uh, you're actually were in the last case and writing header row. That's well, actually not too bad for what's going on now. Okay, beautiful. There is one other thing that you might want to consider doing as part of this whole process, because we get all those intermediate data values. 
What some people like to do, though, is actually get the image values, too. And by that, I mean, oh, when this thing is dancing around out here, and it's incrementing by 3, and it's going to 25, yeah. those intermediate states may or may not be interesting to you. So we can go through and capture the images if you want to. And if you'd actually like to capture the images, there's actually a very nice function for doing that. If you open up say no over there. If you open up uh, 5B, you'll see we've changed the graph ever so slightly here. We still have all of that if then, it's all kind of doing what it's doing, though loop well, it's doing what it's doing. We're still on every round going through and setting those things, but we actually have another little node in there that all it's gonna do is basically export the image. It's gonna take a snapshot every time through. And that's actually kind of a useful thing to do. So in terms of making that help, Happen um, the sort of the whole notion of an image directory and a file suffix. If you want to sort of store those images, we just need to feed those values. And let's go ahead and try that in our example here. Looks like they're all pointing to bad things right now. Let me go back over here and for my image directory. Let's go ahead and choose, I'm just going to put it, how about, for me, I'm going to put it on my desktop, I'm going to make a new folder in there and call this my uh, session 16 result. Okay, so that's the directory I want to put the images in. Then I can decide whether I want it to be a PNG or a JPG. I'll pull those into that node. So image directory. Super. Let's take a look at that node for just a second. It's actually not a bad one. You just open that up and you can edit it. And you'll see what it's going to do is it's going to take the existing document, the current Excel or Reddit document. It's going to take that directory, okay, pull off kind of the directory part. That is the, uh, the first part of the path as a string. It's going to basically get the first item from the row. Oh, what's happening here is it's basically going to uh, get the, um, what it's the test value and use that as a suffix, just at the tail end. So the different images will always have kind of which test value was being used and it reach those different images. But it's basically gonna say view export as image and what that does is it just creates an image file, a PNG or a JPEG of the current Revit screen. Now, you'll notice there's one other thing going on up here at the top, result data row going to result data row it looks like we're just sort of passing it through, and we are. And the reason we need to do that is just back over in the loop, what I need to do is have the result that the result come from here, go to here, and then ultimately that result has to get passed down so we can do the comparison. So it's kind of strange to think about values just passing down from one node to another. That's what's going on back there. Okay, so the tail end of all this, if you go through and run this now, should be, oh, fairly similar. Let me go ahead and just uh, make the path of the text file the same too. Okay, so I'm going to go through and run this. What am I running from? I'm going up to 1,200. Let me change it up to 1,500. So 
So what it's going to do is at each of those different points, it's going to create a snapshot. And now if I go back out to Windows, and I go to my desktop, and take a look in there, I actually have a whole series of different images. Okay. What it's doing is result 10, result 11, result 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So it's just marching through and giving me different images for each of those different times. So interesting. Not too off the bed. Okay. And there was a lot to take in in that last thing. The whole loop while is a very confusing thing. But let's answer some questions about it before we go on. It's like, you know. It's one of the three ways you have to deal with it, but let's just kind of sort of see you know, if it's sort of resonating or you have any specific questions, or it may just be easy to sort of play with it and practice a little bit. But how about for you guys? You look sort of like, hmm, I'm just not so sure about this. This is frozen. <laughs> let's see what's going on with that. Hmm. What for you, Doc? Is it coming with through anything? Yeah, but I put it in the wrong side. Oh, no worries. OK. That is, so that's the looping. That's yeah. fine in terms of the path there. Okay. And then are, are you doing the image, or are you just doing the uh, like pull down a little further? Okay. And then for this node, go ahead and let's take the image directory. That's uh, like, Sorry. yeah, take that up to the directory. And let's take the. Uh, suffix to be either PNG or JPG, I think there's a value over there. Okay, got that? Okay. Or up to the image okay. suffix. Okay, now let's go through and make sure that's actually a directory on your uh, path. So go ahead and just maybe on your desktop or somewhere, just go ahead and put a new folder and choose it. some other stuff that's going on in this sort of example. Come back into Revit for just a second here. Okay. If you continue to pad around in there and look at the example, you'll find there's some other interesting stuff in there too. Oh, over on the yellow zone to the side over there, there's something going on there which is actually very similar to what we were doing in the example uh, just a moment ago, uh, where we were scaling the color of the different rooms based on how close they were. Here what I'm doing is, I'm just going through and saying, you know, what is the current result? That is the result of uh, what we think of the best fit is given the increments versus the target then sort of scaling it accordingly. We're going through and just putting in different color valuations based upon how good the result is. Okay. And the idea of this is that I think in the logic I was trying to illustrate here was that you know, if you were on the good side, you could come close to the value and meet the value, you got a green. If you actually put in a value initially that exceeded the target value, so something that yeah, then you get a red at some time. It was just really all about trying to give you some visual feedback to say that you know, you're just off in terms of your initial assumptions relative to what you're trying to achieve. But let's see if we can make that work. For example, over here, let me zoom to fit that again. I'll pan this over. and say that if, for example, as we started, 
instead of starting at 10, if I start with a value which is already too high, for example, I start with a value of 20. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. Okay, it's gonna give me a slightly yellow color. That's just gonna mean I'm a little bit high relative to what I should be. If I start with a value of 30, okay, it's giving me red. That's just to sort of indicate, hey, I'm stopping with your first value, but you're way over right now. Whereas if I start with a value of like 15, I'll start low and then I'll turn green because I was actually able to achieve it. So the color feedback is, yeah, there's lots of things you can do with color feedback to sort of make it work. Yeah, but at a high level, that's looping. But let's talk about as a final step here what you can do with looping that uh, might be interesting and kind of useful to you as you start thinking ahead. Actually, I should point out that out in the file sets, if you want to play around with looping a little bit, you might try opening up this file instead, which is a little more interesting. This is the Freedom Tower example. And you might recognize that form from the New York skyline these days, or a variation on that form from the New York skyline these days. Um, this is again kind of a cool parametric object that you can change a lot of things on. You can, for example, change the overall tower height. Okay, uh, I'll make it like 1,200 feet instead. Okay, you can go through and change, let's see what I actually called it there. It's the flat side one. So if you think about these sides as being flat versus the sides that sort of slope up, it's really just the length of that thing. So if you, for example, put in a tower flat side of close to zero, don't put in zero. If you put in like 10 or something like that, okay, you end up with a tower which has very little of the flat and it's almost all kind of the sloping sides coming up. There are actually some towers like that in the world too. That's kind of a familiar shape. In fact, the Freedom Tower is sort of like that in some ways. Okay. Or you can go through and put in a very large distance. For example, if I put in there close to 200, or let me try this. Let's see if it breaks. Looks like I'm sort of capping there in terms of being a perfectly straight up tower. The idea of this, though, is as you go through and play with these input parameters, you may be sort of wondering how many square feet of floor area you're achieving. So the idea is you could go through and play with the height or go through and play with that whole issue of the flatness of the sides. And it's kind of an interesting interaction between the two. If you say that you, know, you always want to maintain a certain amount of floor area, you'll find that as you sort of raise the tower up or shrink the tower down, you have different flexibility in terms of uh, how much roundness you can give it or how much sharpness you can give it. So the well loop is actually useful for looking at something like this. You can go through and say, great, I'm going to try this. Let me just keep on going until I get the right amount of floor area. Super, stop. That's the right value for you know, a certain degree of uh, squishiness on the side. So you can go through and just kind of really quickly get to some specific values that are going to meet that target. Okay, let's go ahead and I'm going to, as a last thing today, just kind of shift your thinking a little bit to another way of approaching this. Okay, and that is the idea of a genetic algorithm. And in terms of the genetic algorithm, there's actually several interesting resources available out there for you that we'll sort of pursue next time. There's actually a Dynamo node or a Dynamo package that's very good to work with. It's called Optimo, and it's a good one for you to download and install on your machines. So at some point between now and then, go ahead and download Optimo. 
Um, it's actually written by someone named Mohammed, who's currently at uh, Autodesk. He was working at Texas A&M. He may still be finishing up his PhD, but has done just really some fantastic work in putting this together in terms of implementing a genetic algorithm. And there actually is a couple different, uh, there are a couple different resources out there, which I want to point you to, optimal resources. There's sort of um, some overall high level kind of overview of the system. But there's also actually a really interesting paper here that was written about how they could use this to go through and optimize window sizes kind of for a specific structure right down to some of the dynamo graphs that were used to go through and create it. So it's definitely kind of a cool thing to be looking at. We'll kind of look at that in more detail later. But let me give you sort of the overall sense of what Optimo is about. Optimo is all about this. If you have several different input variables and you have a very large shift space, instead of going through and going and exhaustively marching through that space, we will try just sending out oh, finders into the field. We'll do it randomly. We'll go anywhere between the value of the x's at different random points, anywhere in the value of the y's at random points. We'll say, we're going to create a population of finders that are going to go out there and just test the waters. Okay. And based upon the results that we get as we have a limited number of binders or just kind of testers out there um, and reporting back their values, we'll say, ooh, okay, hey, Jacqueline got a really interesting result that's close to where we want, but Andrew, he was over there that didn't look so on, but Claire looked pretty interesting too. Okay, so we're going to go through and regenerate the second generation. Okay, for the second generation, we're going to try and pick up the favorable attributes of Jacqueline and Claire and have more of the population have those attributes and fewer of them have Andrew's attributes. Okay, so we'll get more and more data points in this area and we'll test that. And based on that, okay, ooh, Dom's going to enter in the picture. So we now have three points and we'll just really get closer and closer and we keep on just narrowing in by always biasing towards the attributes of the ones that already yielded pretty good values as we go through and evaluate them. Okay. Let's see if we can actually uh, show you how that works. Nah, I'll save that for next time. But yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, we'll save that for next time in terms of doing it. There's an example out there that starts to look at finding the minimum point on a surface but that actually does sort of a really good example because you can sort of see it mathematically in terms of just different points, x and y. We vary the x's and y's, and we're always finding the minimum point. So it casts a field of like 50 points based on the most favorable ones. It recasts it as a new field of 50 points, and it zeroes in and finds the lowest point. So if you want to play ahead, go ahead and open up and run the examples within 16.3.1. You'll start that. But if you don't want to, and you just want to start thinking ahead, go ahead and think about it, because it works the same way we sort of talked about earlier, I want you to think about your project. It always works in terms of, you basically have input variables, and you can have as many different input variables as you want, but the more input variables, the more search space you're creating, okay? and it has different evaluation functions. So always be thinking in terms of what you can vary on the input and what you're going to evaluate the solution by. And then if we have more than a single evaluation function, it starts to give us something that tries to be a compromise between the two, or at least gives you equally attractive ones. Okay? So we'll save that for next time so we can kind of give it its due. Okay. Let us pause for today then, and just between now and then, be thinking ahead to what your uh, project might be, or what you might want to tackle.